and uh, played a role in exploiting the dissent that uh, existed within the Communist Party itself um, in terms of their support for the war and the reasons why they changed direction. And we made uh, gains, you know, for instance, we won one of the uh, leaders of the Invergord Mutiny, uh, you know, the Naval, the Royal Navy one. We won a convener of the Nottingham Ordnance uh, Factory and the groups of workers around the country. And uh, by the way, we also did uh, work in the Labour Party in Edinburgh, which, you know, for peculiar reasons, was a flourishing branch of the Labour Party, mainly because of the concentration of industry in that particular uh, area. Now, we were a thorn in the side of the Communist Party. There's many occasions when our comrades got severe beatings as a result of uh, you know, the Communist Party taking measures against us. And they produced, uh, for instance, a uh, pamphlet called uh, Hitler's Agents Exposed. And uh, as Ted said, it would have required a boot to reply to it. But in order to uh, you know, have a go, they, uh, the WIL produced a leaflet offering a hundred, uh, ten pounds reward if anyone could show any page without three fundamental lies. And this was distributed to all the factories. And um, nobody claimed the ten quid. And you know it was a great source of amusement to workers in the factory who had a go at go the local Communist Party members. In actual fact, the CP even, um, you know, attempted to seek the aid of, uh, you know, jingoistic elements in the Tory party to attack, attack us. Uh, for instance, um, Sir Hugh Lucas Tooth was used in the Parliament to attack our position on uh, Japan. <coughs> um, they uh, ra raised the question of, um, you know, the atrocities that the Japanese had created in Hong Kong itself, you know, such as beheadings, and we put out a special edition of the Socialist Appeal, and uh, saying that Hong Kong and this too, and pictures of uh, Britain uh, with the heads of the Malayan, um, you know, fighters, uh, which have been beheaded by uh, British troops, the proof of uh, you know prisoners being taken, which has been used since the war, by the way, and uh, Gallagher who was the leader, the, one of the, uh, Hugh, Will Gallagher um, sent a copy to Sir Hugh and uh, he demanded Parliament to stop our publication and uh, Herbert Morrison, who was the Home Secretary, um, said we're watching and warning and uh, if we do take action I'm sure it will have the warm support of Mr Gallagher and he was having a, a, a side swipe at Gallagher because the Communist Party had physically attacked um, Herbert Morrison in 1935, where Herbert Morrison got a beating from Communist Party members during the period of socialist fascism. We were under scrutiny uh, from the uh, cabinet itself. Uh, when the cabinet papers were released, it was, um, there'd been discussions about the will, and uh, the conclusion was that we were generally anti-fascist. And they'd even gone to the extent of um, studying the health records for the co uh, leading comrades of the organisation. But we'd been warned about this by Maxton, uh, one of the leaders of the ILP and MP at that time. Anyway, between 1941 and 1944, the tendency developed, and we maintained a, a presence in the uh, Labour Party. And a faction in the ILP, which we had, one people such as Roy Tears, you know, who played a prominent role in the RCP. T. Dan Smith of less fame, uh, you know, the infamous <laughs> T. Dan Smith of uh, the prison section of uh, the organisation, and Bill Hunter, who is, uh, was one of the leaders of the WRP and is still alive and well in uh, Liverpool, who moved the expulsion of Ted from the RCP. Um, we controlled two divisions of the ILP uh, in Durham and uh, Cumberland and we were a constant problem for the ILP leaders itself but the main gains that we made were industrially and 90% uh, of the world membership was uh, working class. <coughs> we had an attitude to uh, conscription at that time. We opposed the position of the ILP's uh, you know, pacifist role of conscientious objection and, uh, you know, whilst recognising the bravery of uh, many of these individuals, we pointed out that they were away from the class. And uh, w we had a policy of following the same fate as uh, our class uh, and d doing revolutionary work in the army itself, not leaving them to the uh, mercy of the officers. 
Uh, currently, there's a play, I can't remember the name of it, about the Cairo Forces Parliament yeah, on the television. Well, uh, we made a big intervention in that. So it was used towards the end of the, the war as a means of lifting the morale of the troops. Um, and because of the fact that there was a demand for discussion on what was going to happen after the Second World War, and the Eighth Army formed the Cairo Forces uh, Parliament and it became a platform for the Fourth International indication of the moods of opposition that were developing within the army itself. Frank Ward, who is now um, you know, a avowed enemy and is employed by Transport House as an expert on Trotskyism, um, during that period was uh, one of the best soldiers in the British Army and uh, because he was immaculate as a soldier, he was continually getting posted from uh, pillar to post, uh, getting moved around the uh, world. Uh, and, you know, a CO couldn't understand why such a good soldier was being moved on until he found out when they, they got him. But, uh, he, you know, he kept on, he was like a, a germ, you know, he was passing on the message of our ideas. And uh, it ended up with, with him getting an honourable discharge from the army. And uh, in the Socialist Appeal, we opened up a campaign demanding to know why a healthy man uh, who wished to fight the uh, common foe was discharged from the army and even had the complaints raised through the ILP uh, MPs in Parliament itself. Um, there was a growth of industrial activity, although strikes were unofficial at that particular time. and. Uh, we intervened and uh, on the basis of our assistance, uh, for instance in Barrow, uh, uh, 50,000 engineering workers came out on strike during the war and uh, Roy Tears and Jimmy Dean were co-opted onto the strike committee as ad advisors uh, and they followed our uh, strategy and tactics and gained a victory. Uh, in the miners' strike in Kent of Bethanger, they went 50,000 miners uh, went, out, went out on strike and they said, for instance, uh, in their material, 50,000 miners can't be wrong. Uh, because of our approach, we received sympathetic uh, you know, appreciation of our work, although we didn't win anyone um, from that particular work. We built up a network in the AEU, but uh, the development of uh, will laid the basis of us uh, coming the official section of the 4th International and uh, led to the fusion of the best elements in the RSL and leading to the formation of the RCP and another drink of water. The wing of the um, uh, RSL, the, the Harbour faction, had just um, manoeuvred to expel the majority <laughs> from their organisation. You know, it just it showed the, the kind of internal life that was uh, taking place. But this coincided with the uh, arrival of Stuart, who was an emissary of uh, cannons from the SWB and the, uh, uh, the International. And they recognised uh, the, the will's progress and uh, also had to, uh, you know, recognise that uh, the will had carried forward the policies of... Uh, particularly the military policy of the Fourth International, and it actually re reproduced militant articles, you know, which were relevant to that policy in so uh, the Socialism, which was our journal. And um, <coughs> they had the quandary of, uh, you know, the other organisation representing their policies and the official organisation rejecting them. So uh, they'd come to the conclusion that it had nothing in common with Trotskyism. It was sectarian and also left organisation and had an opportunist attitude to the Labour Party. But um, Stuart, before recognising Willis, uh, you know, the tendency and the, uh, as a tendency, raised the question of unification. And uh, we said we weren't opposed to unification, but it would be on a, a, a principal basis that there would be a strategic and tactical and political position laid down before fusion as a result of democratic uh, discussion of the lessons of uh, you know, the formation of the RSL in 1938. And um, this was eventually um, accepted 
documents were published to prepare for the uh, fusion where the RSL criticised uh, our military uh, policy as a social chauvinism and by the way at the same time attacking the fourth international's position and um, in that sense the uh, the unification um, took place but prior to that there was an attempt to reunify the RSL into one you know broken into the the, the three um, the bits thankfully by the way uh, one of the gifts that we've had you know in the militant era of our organization is that we haven't had many internal struggles you know unlike uh, particularly the IMG you know which seems to split and split and split so, you know thankfully we've had very few you know major battles and destructive battles of this particular na nature that we've always on the basis of uh, you know healthy discussion within the, the organization have uh, always ironed out the problems that have uh, existed as far as that was uh, concerned but um, anyway uh, for instance um, we agreed not to take any measures against those uh, working in the Labour Party. And in actual fact, whilst uh, you know part of the RSL were an entrance faction in the Labour Party, we ha ha weren't an entrance faction. Had more people in the Labour Party than uh, that th they did. That they'd have the right to publish uh, bulletins and continue as a faction. And uh, Healy, by the way, who represented. Uh, what was called the uh, United Trotskyist tendency, he'd been expelled from the organisation several times, said that we had no uh, political dis differences and we uh, disbanded our uh, faction and it was laughed at the uh, conference. Phelan, who was the uh, international s secretary, um, protested at, at the laughter and said it was con you know, scandalous that Comrade should take that, uh, um, that, that stance and congratulated Healy for his undertaking, but that that night met uh, Healy and some of the others uh, in a, a secret enclave at the Dorchester uh, Hotel in order to uh, lay a plan to get rid of the anti-internationalist uh, RCP leadership. You know, we gained the leadership of the organisation despite there being no political differences. and. Um, The RCP, uh, as it was created, became an acute embarrassment, particularly the Communist Party, because it was orientated to the best revolutionary workers and um, had the ability to appeal to Labour Party uh, workers. Four fifths of the membership were working class, and uh, it began, you know, because of the healthy approach to work, began to solve the problems of factionalism. That had, um, you know, been allowed to be encompassed in the fusion itself. That these became secondary issues because the organisation began to uh, move forward. Now, <clears throat> for instance, uh, at that time, we had a, 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 a mis mistaken perspective in common with the international that um, the international had taken on Trotsky's assessment of the effects of the Second World War and uh, said that war would uh, promote revolutionary developments in Europe, which was correct, uh, but, uh, and would lead to the development of um, mass parties of revolution, which you know, was partially uh, uh, correct, but you know, in a, another sense, they were encompassed particularly in the Stalinist uh, parties. And um, this, we had a perspective of uh, conditions of capitalist crisis with it, be a short, sharp slum, the same as happened after the First World War, with the possibilities of a massive leap forward for the uh, tendency. And uh, that laid down the perspective of building the movement now in preparation for that particular period. We were beginning to sense that the uh, end of the war was in sight, and we would have to look at the post war era. Now, just as uh, an indication of our intervention, uh, that was uh, in 1944, we intervened in the um, apprentices strike in Tyneside. It was an indication of the mood that was developing within the industry itself. That uh, There was conscription at that time, but they introduced the uh, Bevan Boy system where there was a lottery. 
uh, where, where apprentices could be conscripted down the pits as opposed to the army, which wasn't very popularly received. And uh, the RCP comrades uh, gave uh, assistance to the strikers and Tory MPs in particular demanded action against us. And uh, Bellman, the Minister of the Ministry of Labour, prepared um, you know, action against us uh, through MI5. And uh, on one morning, uh, 3 a.m., there was a sim simultaneous raid in London, Manchester, Liverpool, uh, Newcastle, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Nottingham and Leeds. And there was a uh, search for documents and material that taken away to use uh, in the trial. And they arrested uh, uh, Heaton Lee, Heaton Lee, Heaton Lee, it was Ralph Lee who went to South Africa, I'm sorry. Uh, Anna King from Newcastle, Roy Tierce, who was the uh, industrial organiser, and uh, Jock Haston, who was captured in Edinburgh. And they were charged under the 1927 Trades Dispute Act. Uh, Act, Dispute Act. And um, we uh, set up a defence committee. Oh, Well, arising out of the arrest, we sent up a, a defence committee, you know, first contact in the accident in the ILP MPs and Bevan and other, uh, uh, now in Bevan, and other left uh, Labour MPs uh, in order to uh, build a defence uh, against the tax of the capital state machine. And there was an immediate response in the trade unions in particular, where there's thousands of pounds collected and it was tours of trade union branches and Labour parties, but of course the Communist Party remained silent. Uh, they feared to attack us because of the mood within the class <coughs> itself. And uh, those who had been charged who were out on bail uh, spoke at meetings. And uh, although out on bail, uh, Haston gave himself up ceremonially. Um, and as a result of the campaign, we great, gained great influence. Uh, at the trial itself, the comrades were count, uh, charged with uh, 12 counts of uh, conspiracy. And the spectators and jury were quite uh, friendly uh, in their attitude towards the comrades. The comrades themselves, you know, were well prepared and dignified in their attitude and took full responsibility for their actions and, uh, full, you know, espoused full support for the apprentices themselves. But uh, they were found guilty. Uh, in acting, uh, acting in the, the furtherance of the strike only, the other charges were left. Uh, and the only evidence that they had were letters from the, the raid itself. Jock uh, Haston got 12 months. Uh, Tears got, and uh, Lee uh, got nine months. And Anna King uh, got, got a suspended sentence. And uh, they served, while they served in um, the sentence they uh, considered an appeal, but Jock himself, uh, you know, studied law and uh, gave tremendous technical advance to the solicitor, and um, seemingly the general principle on which they that they went to appeal was that uh, you can't act in furtherance of something before it happens, and that was the grounds on which they were uh, released on technical grounds. But the reality was, there's a tremendous movement had come forward, and I think what alarmed the um, you know the bourgeois more than anything was a paper that was published by the troops in the Eighth Army in the desert. They had their own newsletter, and the headlines of the uh, paper, which coincided with the appeal, was "We fight for the right to strike." and the judges accepted the technicality which had been found by Jock. But I think under other circumstances he would have remained on Devil's Island as far as the bourgeois concerned. Uh, in 1945, <coughs> we involved ourselves in the neat by-election. We had um, 16 full-timers sent into the area to build a, a, a base uh, for a by-election which resulted from the death of the local MP and was just 
took place before VE night, which picture Europe, for those of you who can't remember it. Um, of course, it was a Labour Party stronghold, and uh, the Tories wouldn't stand because it was a coalition. Now, we had no members uh, of any great extent in Wales. Uh, we had uh, a few ILP sympathisers, but we had a three month uh, campaign to build up support. And we worked on the platform of anti war and uh, international uh, policy and put forward the, our military policy and uh, called for the end of the coalition with Labour to uh, power and uh, trans uh, called for a transformation of the uh, national and international situation. Um, the CP once again put their material out against us being Hitler's agents and this was taken up by the uh, Labour Party candidate. We challenged the CP to a debate and um, on the eve of poll, but no national leaders would uh, come and uh, at, a, at a, 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 an eve of uh, poll meeting where there was an audience of 3,000, we uh, dealt with the Communist Party dealing with the Moscow trials, the question of uh, fascism put forward, the programme, the tendency. We received overwhelming support, but because of the mood that was occurring within the class itself, because they were looking towards the promise of a Labour government that was a landscape for Labour, but nevertheless, 3,000 people uh, voted for the RCP on our programme. <coughs> Of course, the end of the war also coincided with the Nuremberg trials, and um, the Allies, of course, attempted to place complete responsibility for the war on the shoulders of the Nazis. Although, you know, the Allies, particularly France and Britain, were equally responsible. Uh, they'd hoped at the beginning of the war that Germany would move against Russia, and uh, you know, would solve. Uh, the problems both of fascism and communism at the uh, same time. And uh, we saw the possibility of exposing some of the material that had been used during the Moscow trials, you know, the Trotskyists were the agents of the Nazis, and we in particular wanted um, of, um, Ribbentrop and uh, Hess at the Nuremberg trials, and this was taken up by Natalia Trotsky and a committee uh, was formed of MPs and intellectuals and um, it was taken up internationally but uh, never brought fruition and the bourgeois obviously thought it was better the Trotskyism because of all that it stood for and particularly the lessons he learnt in the war would be uh, better silenced and discredited in this particular manner uh, in the aftermath of the war. Um, <coughs> Of course, the end of the war coincided with the, you know, VE night itself, and the Labour Party broke the um, coalition. But because the Labour Party organisation was defunct, the Tories thought uh, an early election would be an advantage, and they uh, emphasised the fact that uh, Churchill was um, a war hero, and uh, in reality. That received a hostile reaction. There was a landslide victory for um, Labour with a 48% vote for Labour. Uh, nine tenths of the army voted uh, for Labour in particular. And um, of course, this uh, changed the whole situation in Britain and had a direct bearing uh, on the future of the RCP itself. This also, the end of the war, also um, coincided with a whole series of arguments on the international perspective, uh, on the international uh, itself, which I don't intend to um, deal with at this particular um, at a particular time. But um, We began to uh, alter our perspective in re relation to uh, Britain itself uh, and uh, correct you know, some of the uh, mistakes that have been made uh, by, by the international I I I itself. We uh, analysed uh, you know, you know, the, the, 
a slump wouldn't open out as a result of the uh, war. We particularly pointed out the, the fact that uh, there would be a number of um, you know, factors involved in this, and in particular, the injection of martial aid was uh, an important uh, feature of this. The Americans had a problem at the end of the war. They had, in actual fact, benefited from the war economically. Uh, they'd been able to develop new techniques, you know, for instance in shipbuilding, just as one example, although it was never really reflected in, in the American shipbuilding industry, you know, the use of prefabricated vessels and welding, all welded vessels, just one example alone. Uh, so they had accrued tremendous wealth, but at the same time, because of the destruction of war in Europe itself, the market for their goods had been destroyed. And there was also the spectre of revolutionary developments taking place in Europe itself, where you know the uh, uh, the resistance movements in France, Italy, and uh, Greece, uh, you know, were under control of the communists, and uh, it almost appeared on the surface that there would be, uh, you know, um, these countries, you know, could have uh, been been taken over by the communists. Of course, uh, we were later realised that Stalin betrayed revolutionary protest and handed pa power back to the bourgeois. But nevertheless, the Americans decided uh, that they would have a massive injection of the aid, and this was the Marshall Aid uh, Plan. And th they uh, used it for two reasons, to offset the threat of revolution and also to create a market for their own uh, goods. And uh, that also ensued with a period of uh, rebuilding where you know, that meant that uh, industry had uh, you know, an impetus and there was also the injection of uh, you know, public money, um, you know, Keen the adoption of Keynesian policies, which also, for an initial period, uh, added an imp impetus to um, you know, the, the developments. By the way, the Labour Party itself, on the surface, were taking uh, you know, socialist measures. Uh, it appeared um, we, we didn't oppose nationalisation itself, although we raised the question of workers' control of management of those industries. But on the surface, it seemed to be socialist. But in actual fact, what they were were measures of state capitalism, where they uh, provided British capitalism who were on their knees financially with the cheapest gas, electricity, transportation, steel. All these uh, factors helped to uh, reinvigorate British capitalism uh, itself. And uh, we've also got to say that in terms of colonial freedom, which was given to countries such as Burma, uh, Ceylon and India, that uh, these measures on the surface also seem to be a contribu contribution to a socialist future. But what happened was uh, there was, was a recognition that they couldn't have held these countries that they the hole in these countries there would be far greater than the benefit they accrued in terms of taking profit from them. And the turning point in that policy was the fact that the Indian um, Navy mutinied after the war and uh, they realised that the game was up as far as that was concerned. So, of course, on the surface, it appeared to the working class and activists that the Labour Party was carrying out reforms given independence to the colonies, they built the National Health Service. Was this the beginning of uh, social revolution? Lasky, Harold Lasky, who was the, one of the chief theoreticians of social democracy, you know, a representative of the ideas of reformism, said that the Labour Party would be in office for 20 to 25 years and there would, during that period there would be a gradual movement towards socialism. Um, and this uh, reflected it similarly in the uh, difficulties for the RCP itself. <clears throat> During the war, we'd had uh, a sale of 20,000 papers per fortnight, which is some going, that's better than what we're doing now, and that's your fact. We had an influence over tens of thousands of uh, workers. Uh, but now the working class felt that the Labour Party was doing the jobs. And the Communist Party workers pointed, were able to point to the developments in China and Eastern Europe as uh, you know, the uh, USSR carrying out the revolution in those sectors of the area. So the RCP, for various reasons, began to become 
isolated, and that was reflected in a decline in uh, uh, paper sales. And this was despite having a correct policy. And there were some parallels, uh, you know, you could say that the dog days that were um, experienced by the Bolsheviks in 1905 to 1912 as a result of the defeat of the revolution, or the that were faced by the Russian left opposition between 1923 and uh, 1933. And it was a question then for the organisation of holding on to the fundamental uh, ideas of raising the theoretical uh, level of contacts and uh, overcoming the pressures on the me membership, uh, you know, from the point of view of uh, the pressures of reformism and Stalinism, of building up resistance and an explanation through perspectives of, uh, you know, what the future developments uh, w would be. Even you know our rich sympathisers uh, as a source of um, a source of income had uh, declined because uh, there was no revolution. Uh, revolution as it had been um, promised. <coughs> so onto the scene again came uh, Jerry Healy, who, uh, in some respects, was seen as the the golden boy of the international. He reflected their uh, policies. Over the years, he'd been the source of uh, many disputes which emanated from the United Secretary, you know, people like Pierre Frank, James Cannon, Mandel. And um, at the end of the war, he'd gone, gone as far as raising the question of entry into the ILP. But um, after the defeat of the Neat by-election, Pierre Frank raised the question of our entry into the Labour Party and he put forward this policy within the organisation was defeated. But he was able to uh, feed on the growing disillusionment and began to look for miracle shortcuts and uh, gain support amongst uh, sections of the uh, membership, uh, you know, where sections of them were moving in the direction of reformism itself. So he was able to develop a base within the RCP. But uh, conditions for entry weren't there. There was no development of a left wing, there was no ferment within the party, you know, in terms of the position that had been laid down by Trotsky. Um, in actual fact, because of the success of reformism, because of the world economic upswing, because of the developments after the uh, war, the bureaucracy felt strong and confident, you know, for instance, um, the Labour Party was seen to be carrying out these reforms. The working class were experiencing a, a Labour uh, government. But for the first time after 47, Healy, and he's continued to do this year in, year out, has discovered the world economic crisis. Uh, this coincided with the 1947 uh, fuel crisis. Uh, because of the disruption of the period immediately after the war, there was one million people unemployed. But he described it as the last crisis of capitalism. I mean, it was horrendous. I mean, I, I can personally, you know, remember 1947. It was the, the worst weather I've ever, ever experienced, where there was 18 inches of snow in Liverpool, uh, where there was frost on the ground until May, where there was coal shortages. You know, we caught the bloke next door stealing coal from us going onto the railway tracks and digging up skis with steel and railway sleepers to uh, find fuel and all this kind of thing, chopping trees down in the park. It was that, uh, that, that bad, you know, that desperate. But um, Healy spoke of mass unemployment and discovered a left wing in the uh, Labour Party. And um, as, a, as a, a means of providing an argument for work in the Labour Party, in actual fact, we had more comrades in the Labour Party than Healy did, you know, at that particular time as a, a, a faction. Nothing was happening in the Labour Party, but Healy gained a base of between 70 and 80 members out of uh, 500 me members, mainly middle class in composition. And um, there was a discussion, you know, throughout 1945, 46, 47 around these uh, issues. And uh, we had a majority of, uh, you know, a vast majority of 420 uh, out of 500 uh, members. And we still managed to make minor, uh, you know, gains in the aftermath of the 
war, even though there were uh, difficulties. But in 1947, um, we uh, closed the discussion on entry into the Labour Party, you know, under the statutes of uh, democratic centralism. Uh, you've got to put a timetable on discussion. You know, you can't discuss issues ad infinitum because of the disruption it would uh, cause. And there was a, a guillotine put on the uh, discussion. And um, Healy's minority voted uh, against. And um, against the statutes of the international, they decided to separate and enter the uh, Labour Party under their own banner and uh, internal discipline. They actually formed a broad left paper and were involved with people such as uh, Tom Braddock, Bessie Braddock, who was not a relation, uh, in uh, the Socialist Fellowship and a uh, paper called Socialist Current, I think it was. Uh, the RCB continued the task of building an independent revolutionary party. Healy had uh, gone, uh, although he was, uh, you know, he'd been an, an irritant, uh, but the objective conditions were uh, against us. And um, as a, despite you know, a period of hard work, uh, based on the economic boom and the sort of social democracy and Stalinism, and a similar process taking place internationally, capitalism was consolidated for a period of uh, time. The Labour Party right wing was strong, and that was in particular expressed in the great scale of the area, which was near in my uh, period of uh, experience, where. You know, the ideas of Marxism were described as um, Victorian, and uh, you know even the Bevanite wing, the party, which uh, you know was the left wing, were in no way as strong as Crips was during the you know the the, the their small grouping uh, in the pre-war period. So uh, we we had to prepare the membership to keep them intact, and we still maintained a good base in uh, Birmingham, Glasgow. Manchester, uh, London, and Liverpool. But the Heliites began to uh, d disintegrate the act. There was no mass movement as they'd uh, predicted. And they laid the blame uh, with the RCP, although, as I said, we had uh, more members than they did in the Labour Party. They went to the International and said that we were stifling their work. And um, the Healy, you know, manipulated the United Security who ordered us to withdraw from the Labour Party uh, or our international our position as the uh, representative of the Fourth International would be reconsidered. Now, <coughs> Haston, Jock Haston, who was begin reflecting the period and was, I believe, under the influence of uh, reformism himself. Uh, had no uh, illusions in uh, Healy, but raised the question of uh, entrism into the Labour Party. It was a sign of his tiredness, you know, a look for an easy route. He was defeated on the executive and decided, uh, resigned as general secretary. But um, after a period of struggle on the executive, they won a majority, with t Ted Grant and Jimmy Dean being in a minority. Now. Ted and Jimmy were faced with a dilemma. If they campaigned uh, nationally, they would have won the membership. Uh, Ted had no doubt about that. But he felt it would isolate Haston and company uh, whilst educating the membership. And Ted said, to quote him, we made uh, an opportunist mistake. Uh, we saw the question of saving the leadership, which had been forged, forged in struggle, um, rather than you know the education of the membership, and uh, they issued a, a statement, an incorrect statement, of uh, saying that in or out we had little to uh, gain, you know, which was a part accommodation to that particular position. They saw a question of maintaining the leadership in order to keep the organisation intact. Now, the sections of the rank and file, including Sammy Bornstein, the uh, author of the uh, book, you know, that's uh, just come out recently. They formed a fa faction, but um, it, it, for a party, but, uh, and they argued that, um, it, you know, it, it, if you go into the Labour Party, he would be the uh, leader. And Haston, of course, said yes, 
um, that would be so for a period, but we you know, could defeat Healy uh, if we maintain the organisation. And uh, Ted and Jimmy voted for entry into the Labour Party, but uh, being against uh, Healy, uh, and we had five times more members. But um, Ted and Jimmy were only a small minority, and uh, even the Open Party faction voted for you with uh, Healy. Uh, as a result of this, the International, who were wanting to move against particularly uh, Ted, push forward uh, a formula insisting that Healy would have a built-in majority on the executive of the RCP, not in proportion to the membership that he had as a faction. And uh, there would be no full-timers except uh, Healy and myself, and uh, they would have the right to, uh, because of the majority on the executive, of appointing future full-timers. And there would be no discussion on the uh, question of perspectives in the six months leading up to the election of a new leadership. So the RCP, obviously, for the, this reason alone, was um, in a process of dis, uh, disintegration. And that injected their uh, confidence into uh, Healy. And he expelled, um, he expelled you know, the majority from the, um, the organization, people who were in opposition to uh, him. Uh, Haston threw in his gloves, uh, resigned from the organisation six weeks before the uh, co uh, conference. He'd drifted into the NCLC and became a full-time organiser with Frank Ward. And uh, the membership were, uh, were ordered by Healy to uh, break off personal contact with Haston. You know, people who'd been com comrades you know, for donkey years, or they'd be expelled from the uh, party. And uh, this happened in numerous uh, cases. And uh, in 1950, Ted, both Ted and J Jimmy were uh, expelled from the Labour Party itself. Now, Ted will tell you that they took a, part, uh, a decision to enter the Labour Party at a time when entry into the Labour Party would not be beneficial to us, but he pointed out that uh, you had to contend with the traditions in the ranks of the working class and their attitude towards the Labour Party, firstly. And uh, secondly, that you were talking about a handful of people. They were in no way a, a party. So they entered the Labour Party. And um, the major base that we built in the Labour Party, and in some respects, didn't reflect the uh, time, but they built the base in the Walton constituency in Liverpool. You just said that Ted and uh, Jimmy Dean were expelled from the Labour Party. No, sorry, from, from the, the RCP. RCP yeah. <coughs> and entered the Labour Party. Um, with a, you know, a handful of comrades, we had a small organisation in Liverpool, some in London, you know, very few, but the main concentration of the membership was in Liverpool. Now, the peculiarity of Walton is that at a time when reformism was strong, we had a combination of two factors, I believe. I don't know if anyone, you know, people from that era might uh, agree with me in my analysis, but on the one hand, we won a political majority in Walton. You know, we fought political battles to win our base for our policies. But at the same time, we had an organiser for the constituency in the form of Laura Curtin, who, by the way, is an avowed enemy of ours is uh, siding with Kilfoyle and the right wing in the Labour Party now, which is a, you know, tragic to me, uh, you know, knowing their history. But we built a, an impregnable fortress because we had the best organised constituency in the country at that particular time, and in some respects it hasn't been surpassed. It became a platform for our ideas where we intervened, you know, on the issues of uh, policy, the Labour Party uh, conference where we had uh, our youth magazine uh, rally, um, you know, which was um, had originally been the our journal uh, and was published originally by the Birkenhead Head Labour, Part, uh, Labour League of Youth. youth. Rally uh, gets its name from Read All About the Labour League of Youth. It's very clever. And uh, it was taken up by Walton constituents who financed our paper 
which was duplicated but had an international circulation. Now, Ted stood as the, uh, was selected as the parliamentary candidate during that period of time. Uh, our, our work in Walsen uh, was from between 1952 to 1959, um, but Ted wasn't endorsed by the NEC. But in 1959, George McCartney, who was a comrade at that time, he was one of the people who won from the ILP, he became the candidate. Who's the name? George McCartney. And was Ted Sawyer too? He was 55 before my time. Um, but the point is, and it's an interesting conjunction, <coughs> despite having the best organised constituency in the country, it wasn't sufficient to overcome the trend within the working class at that particular time. The Labour Party expected to be elected to power in '59. And whilst, you know, we worked tremendously uh, hard, um, there were factors, you know, for instance, <coughs> I've got to say this, uh, I, I believe that George, you know, um, retreated from some of the policies, you know, he softened them, uh, you know, on public platforms. Well, he didn't pursue our position aggressively enough, but uh, the political material was mainly written by Ted and was magnificent, you know, in terms of the intervention that we made. But the trend was against the Labour Party nationally. And what we'd built in uh, Walton was lost overnight as a result of the personal recriminations that took place. And I've got to say, it, that alone was a reflection of the difficulty of working in the Labour Party at that time. Where comrades had slogged year in, year out, at a time, you know, when uh, reformers were strong, where we had to be extra sensitive in uh, the material that we uh, published, uh, you know, uh, in all our material, uh, so as not to give an excuse. Called Socialist Fight, which was theoretically produced monthly, but sometimes lapsed. Sometimes, uh, you know, it was reduced to a duplicated uh, journal. I just ask you, you know, when Ted was uh, selected and working yeah. in uh, Walton, well, did he yeah. actually live in the little program? Um, now, I'm only going to deal with some, you know, highlights, some of which you'll probably know yourself, but uh, I want to deal with a dispute that opened up in 1958-59-60 in the organisation, which was similarly a reflection of the period that we were passing in terms of the strength of uh, reformers. Uh, you've got to realise that when we're talking about an organisation, again, we're talking about less membership than you've got in this, uh, you know, this area. We're talking about 50 people nationally, virtually. Um, but in 1958, Ted posed the question in the, the perspectives document that the po possibility of a slump developing, and there opened up in the organisation a, a huge dispute uh, on whether there would be a slump now. Uh, the document is being published, I don't know if it's in this one, on the question, is it, will there be a slump? Uh, well, that, that I believe is a major document of the organisation because uh, it opened up a struggle against the, you know, the ideas of the international, where arguments were being prevent, presented in a revisionist form, reflecting uh, you know, the uh, period of reformers and the economic upswing that was taking place. Capitalism had solved some of the problems, particularly through straight intervention into the economy, and that was reflected in the uh, organisation. And uh, also, a dispute opened up equally important on the question of the nature of the paper. And uh, I, I bet it's not in here, but uh, there was a document, uh, a Marxist paper, and the proposal came from uh, the Nottingham and Leicester branches of the organisation that we should liquidate our paper and, you know, virtually liquidate the organisation and that we would form a broad left paper, uh, you know, which would uh, encompass on the editorial board left MPs and provide them with a platform on the principle that we would criticise those MPs, you know, for what they say, that we would maintain unity, you know, in terms of providing a bed for, you know, left elements to uh, warm themselves in a, in a very cold atmosphere. 
and uh, a very bitter dispute broke out on those two particular uh, questions, which led to the um, breakaway f from the organisation. I wasn't I joined the organisation in '58 and wasn't, you know, completely aware of all the, you know, the internal developments that were taking place. But it led to the formation of organisations such as the uh, International Marxist Group, um, the Left Fraction in Scotland deep interest organisation. They produced it under the leadership of Harry Selby, who became the uh, MP for government and was defeated by the uh, Scottish Nationalists. He was the first one, you know, by that woman. What was her name? Yeah. Um, but um, <coughs> they were deep interest. But they wouldn't sell you their paper without seeing your Labour Party card. Uh, <laughs> And uh, also, uh, one of the offshoots went in the direction of the Posadists, who uh, eventually uh, formulated a policy that revolution would will only take place after a nuclear holocaust. So where that one out. <laughs> they well, had the Posadists. How do you spell that? No, I, do. I mean, the logic of their position is that it would be a re revolutionary act to build uh, underground shelters. <laughs> preserve the revolutionary cadre. But um, I believe that that, you know, bloodletting, although it left us, you know, a handful of people. And by, the, by the way, uh, part of this dispute took place when I was in the uh, army. And uh, during the time I was in the army, there were discussions on whether we should fuse. It was rumours, particularly Jimmy Dean, who was getting very tired. Was talking about uh, looking at an amalgamation with the uh, with Healy, and uh, later, uh, what I you know consider you know a salutary lesson and a mistake, which I opposed when I was in the army, was uh, to form a uh, a broad left paper with the, what is now the SWP uh, in the form of Young Guard. Now uh, the position there was that. Uh, because of the blows that we'd received in the, the locality, we were unable to produce a uh, rally on a regular basis. And um, we were faced with, uh, you know, the activities of the WRP, uh, sorry, the uh, Socialist Labour League, as it was, Healy's organisation. We'd gained a majority in the youth movement. We had this policy of uh, having dancers and recruiting people on that basis, you know, uh, in a very lump and way, you know, recruiting youth to the ranks uh, without educating them. And, uh, you know, that during that time, we sort of physical attack blows. And the uh, proposal would put forward that that too was a reflection of tiredness, that we form a block with the SWP to produce a youth paper, which um, we, we entered into on the basis that they would uh, produce uh, you know, I ran as a, the main platform of the paper. Now, I argued personally to Jimmy, you know, in my correspondence, that the danger in that would be that uh, one faction would prevail and the other one become the paper sellers for the other's paper, you know, the majority's paper. And because of the in principle way that they were, uh, that they gained control of the paper, and we became paper sellers. And they never produced the youth programme. And they even went to the extent of uh, altering articles that we uh, submitted for their uh, publication in the journal. In particular, Peter, you know, would be going to grow in prominence in the organisation. I just have a, that particular, um, you know, experience. And uh, we then, for a very short period of time, had a paper called Youth for Socialism, which well, was, was, did he actually merge then? Had only a paper, not an organisation, right. only a paper. And uh, we then, uh, for uh, three issues, we had a duplicated journal called Youth for Socialism, which we intervened in the Wires Conference uh, in Brighton uh, very effectively. You know, we had a, a bulletin every day. You know, we intervened very well during that period. But we then had a discussion within the organisation that coincided with 1964 about the uh, need for an independent Marxist journal. There was a dispute, particularly in the Liverpool organisation. Uh, John MacDonald, 
who is an enemy of the organisation now. Uh, who uh, was instrumental in bringing uh, Peter Taff and Tony Mulher to the organisation. He did one thing called the police. Um, he argued that we should have a, a youth journal again based on a constituency party. But we uh, said that we were moving into a different period of time now. You know, our analysis was that there would be you know, important developments in the future. We needed an independent uh, journal. Our uh, publication of the uh, militant coincided with our expulsion from the United Secretariat of the Fourth International, which in some respects <laughs> was probably the best thing that ever ever happened to us. That you know that we cut loose from that uh, organisation because uh, we took a decision mainly because at that time we, we tended to be a youthful organisation that we would concentrate on uh, building our base within the Labour Party. Now the Socialist Labour League had left the Labour Party in 1964. We'd been saddled with uh, probably a uh, constitution even worse than we've got now. Uh, the, the, the bureaucracy of length just they haven't disbanded the YS, they just made it virtually impossible to operate. But in those days, you know, the National Committee was uh, appointed, you know, against some creatures, you know, like Hulk Bates and the, uh, all sorts of the Roger Stoss and horrible people like that. And um, the fellow who's just been booted out as the MEP, Les Hookfield, you know, with people who were uh, sponsored by the right wing at that particular time. But we concentrated on building the youth movement. And um, in 1970, uh, it, this is where I'll end, uh, I think you know, one of the most significant accomplishments of the organisation is when we won the majority in the LPYS. Because from that point on, we began to develop our international work seriously. And it, it also coincided with the ending of an era when our organisation was a uh, propaganda group with its transformation to an organisation which was heavily involved in mass work. <laughs>